for about a month after the attack on Pearl Harbor, we flew out over the ocean off of Oregon and Washington looking for whatever might show up. We didn't know whether the Japanese were going to continue on and attack our west coast. So we were looking for them. After about a, a month of that, we realized that they'd given up that idea, and they were going elsewhere in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. They made the, ja the Pacific Ocean a, a Japanese lake, for, in effect. But they didn't attack our western coastline at that time. They, they didn't have plans for that. Another fellow and I, in about the 1st of February, got orders from Doolittle to go up to Washington, D.C. and work with Air Force Intelligence. This was all very secret stuff. And we were up there for, it was probably less than two weeks, and we got together all the maps and charts that we were going to need for Japan and China, and the target information, the exact location of, of uh, military or industrial plants that we could use for targets. We had to know exactly where those, of course, where they were. Uh, 18th day that we are at sea, we were going to take off late that afternoon, but early in the morning, our convoy of two carriers and four cruisers went between two Japanese, uh, went between picket ships that they had way out there, 650 miles out. Well, our intelligence didn't know that they were covering themselves that far out. We thought we could get within 400 miles before they would catch us if we were lucky. Now, here we were, 250 more miles to fly, but Halsey, who was the admiral on the Enterprise, the other carrier, said, get them off immediately, so that we had to go. These, these two carriers and four cruisers were too valuable to risk at that time in the war. We couldn't afford to lose those ships, so we got off there as fast as we could, and they got the hell out of there. We took off. It was uh, not a beautiful day. There were heavy seas, total overcast at about 2,000 feet. It was a stormy scene when we took off. But in the wind, we had about 25 knots of wind, which we needed. That was real good. And these new carriers, like the Hornet and the Enterprise, could go into the wind top speed at about 30 knots meaning that we were taking off in about 55 knots of wind. That's almost gale force. And that gave us the lift we needed, because we were almost a ton overloaded for what the plane should ever try to take off with. And we had to get off in 400 feet. And all those things combined, and we all got off. With all that wind, the speed of the carriers into that wind, we got airborne. We also, as we went across uh, the ocean, the uh, planes from the Enterprise, the other carrier, threw, flew cover over us and flew reconnoitered out in front because we were, the, the Pacific Ocean was a Japanese lake. They were in command of the Pacific at that time when we crossed. And uh, so we, we had to be ready for them to uh, uh, suddenly appear over the horizon. And they never did, of course until we were 650 miles out, and then we went between their picket ships that they'd put out there. But uh, a life on uh, the carrier was wonderful as far as we were concerned. We got three nice meals a day, and then at 11 o'clock at night, we'd go down for something else to eat, and uh, they treated us wonderfully. And, and at the end of the, uh, the tour, about uh, on the 16th day, the finance officer from the Hornet came to us and charged each one of us who are commissioned officers a dollar a day for our food. <laughs> he had to collect money from us. A dollar a day for three meals and then whatever else we wanted to eat at 11 o'clock. We figured that was a fair bargain, so we were willing to pay that. It took about four to five minutes for each one of our planes to get airborne. And each plane headed in on its own. There was no idea. To form up in formation took gas, and we needed every drop. So each plane went in on its own. The result was the four, first plane that had Doolittle in it got there about, let me see the time, around 
around noon sometime, I guess, because I was in the ninth plane. And by the time we got there, it was, we had gotten out of the bad weather into clear skies and we got over Tokyo. There was anti-aircraft fire everywhere and they had pursuits up after us, but they didn't shoot any of us down. We went in, bombed, we went in at rooftop level. That's, that made it difficult for them. Then when we got to our initial point where you start your bomb run, we pulled up to 1,500 feet and made a run on our target, bombed our target, and dropped back down to rooftop level and got out of there. Being on rooftop level, it's very hard for their pursuits to fool around trying to shoot us down because they had roofs and chimneys and everything to think about, and here we were going along. The only time I got thinking, we've had it, about two hours off out of Tokyo, the, the Japanese thought that they were going to have to get a, a naval force and an air force to clobber our, our task force the next day because they didn't know we, they, they had long-range Army bombers, and they knew that they, their task force would have to sail another day for the short-range Navy bombers to come. So they thought they had that much time. Well, we, we were flying along, and here these cruisers were coming along, and we got too close to one of them, and they opened up on us, and we flew. I thought we'd had it. We flew through columns of water for what seemed like an, an eternity, and they missed us on every— must have driven them crazy. They didn't shoot us down. And we were, that's, that's what I got scared. I thought we'd had it. This is the end of this one. We got to China, it, it was uh, at night. Instead of getting there in the daytime, as our original plans had caused, if we'd taken off when we wanted to, we'd have gotten there in the morning. But this was all changed, and we pulled across the China Sea, heading towards uh, uh, China, in the evening. This was a nighttime flight now. And as I said, four of our planes ditched along the coast. Eleven of us pulled up and flew into the storm. We could hardly see our wingtips for, for several hours. And we flew in there until we ran. The, our engines quit. We bailed out. That's all we could. We couldn't let down. There were mountains underneath us. So we just waited till our engines quit and we bailed out. In a big storm like that, your, your pair, it's a funny sensation that I discovered, uh, that all of us, that 55 men bailed out of 11 planes. And, and uh, they all had the same experience. And, and it was so funny. It, you felt like you were standing still, no movement. And your chute was doing all the movement. And you could just barely see it, but it would go over here and collapse. And then it would, and you think you're losing all your air. It'd fill up, it'd go over here and collapse. Well, what we were in were these tremendous pendulums because a big storm like that has vertical currents, a lot of strong vertical currents. Then as we got closer to the earth, those vertical currents abate, so they, they let up, they're not so strong, and my chute settled over my head. And then I still couldn't see anything except just barely see the chute. And the next thing I knew, a branch of a tree hit my face. Never saw, I never saw anything. It hit my face, and the next second, I was standing on the ground. My shroud lines just allowed me, my chute was all tangled up. My shroud lines just allowed me to reach the ground. Now, you have to be lucky to have that happen. A lot of our guys weren't. They hung over cliffs and uh, hit the ground and broke legs and arms and things like that, but I was so damn lucky. I, it, the chute let me just land. I was standing on the ground, and I tried to get that sucker out of the tree, but I couldn't. It was all... My pilot was a guy named Doc Watson. <clears throat> He a big husky guy, and he got tangled with his shroud lines when his, when his chute opened, and it broke his shoulder. 
and uh, he was in agony. You know, he came down, and he laid. He, he landed in the creek, and he, la he laid there for about a day until some Chinese found him. And we all had these crazy adventures, but Doc never flew again. They brought when the, after they got him back to Walter Reed about a month later. They couldn't bring his arm back, uh, so that he stayed in the Air Force through the war, but he never flew. He flew a desk for the rest of the time. So he was one of the casualties of the Doolittle Raid. I was on the side of a mountain, and uh, the trees, uh, they were, it turned out to be bamboo trees. Bamboo gets bigger than those fishing rod bamboo. They get about, I think about this is a big bamboo tree. And this was a bamboo forest on this mountainside there. I tried to find a, find a level place to lay down. It was dark and, and raining and all. And I could never find it. I just ended up with my feet against a bamboo tree down here and my back against another one. Just stayed there the rest of the night. That's all I could do. We got together, several of us, without Doc Watson, the fellow that broke his shoulder. We didn't find him for several days. But friendly Chinese got us uh, to a friendly village, and over a period of time, we got rescued out of there into other parts of China. It uh, made a great difference in the war. The Doolittle Raid caused the Japanese to change their plans just a few weeks later. They decided they better stop this sort of thing from ever happening again. They got together a big naval force, four carriers. They had battleships and cruisers, and they were heading across the Pacific. And the first thing they wanted to take over was a little island called Midway. And if you remember what happened at Midway, that changed the entire Pacific War. Our boys sunk all four of those carriers, and they couldn't build carriers like we could, as fast as we could. And that changed them from being on the offensive in the Pacific to being on the defensive. They lasted, they held out another three and a half years, but they were always on the defense. And Midway made the big difference. And we had a little a, a dollop of help uh, to get the Japanese over there just at the right time for our boys to do what they did to them. Our naval boys sunk all four of their carriers. And I'm just hanging on. I don't know why. I'm just living on. <laughs> I'm going on to 93. Uh, for some reason, the good Lord's having me hang around a while, and I'm enjoying it.